The notion of self-awareness may bring to mind an image of a highly conscious individual meditating on a mountaintop. I'm sure we'd all love to be in that spot right now, taking deep breaths. It's a nice picture, but self-awareness is not only for exceptional people in amazingly beautiful environments. In simple terms, self-awareness means to know oneself. And it's possible that this greater knowing can and should occur every day, both personally and in business. I think an important life skill is to know who you are. And I think in life, if you know who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are and how you're wired, then you can adapt appropriately to the situation. That's David Spitz, CEO of Channel Advisor, a company that's been facilitating e-commerce since 2001 and has grown along with the industry in big ways. Its customers now number in the thousands and billions in revenue transact through its platform on a yearly basis. Find out on this episode of Business X Factors how self-awareness for a person and a company can lead to greater knowledge of the world and taking actions that lead to success. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, head of strategy at mission.org. Welcome to Business X Factors. Each week, we'll take a look at the secret sauce that takes companies to some of the highest levels of success and then unpack how they got there. We'll explore how these organizations are run and what's so special about the people, the culture, and the processes that make it all happen. Question for you. What do you think is the best use of technology? Our friends at Highland believe technology is about transforming the way we all work so we can be more informed, empowered, and connected through every interaction and in every relationship with everyone we serve. Highland is your X factor for better performance. Go to highland.com forward slash insights to learn more. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D.com slash insights. For David, getting a home computer at the time when computers were really just beginning to rise into the consciousness of some families in America was a really awe-inspiring experience for him. I had a computer, I think, when I was eight years old or something, and I was born in 1972, so that, I guess, puts it right around 1980. So my first computer was an Atari 400. Wow. (laughs) And wow. I think it was like three thousand dollars, which in nineteen eighty dollars was a pretty That's significant a lot. investment. Yeah. And they were famous because the keyboard was a membrane keyboard; like it didn't actually have keys. They were like these membrane things that you pushed. It didn't have a hard drive or any storage. There was an external tape cassette, so if you got a program, it came on a little audio tape, and you put it into the tape cassette, and you hooked it in. You would introduce a bug, and you'd have to figure out like why didn't it work the way. So for someone who was always engineering oriented, like I grew up and like Legos were my thing, like I love building stuff and to like transport that into a virtual environment where you weren't necessarily limited by the physical, how many pieces you had or whatever. It was just magical. I I got lost in that stuff. And then it wasn't very long before David was able to use his blossoming technological skills in the business world. So my stepdad owned his own business and he was an entrepreneur and I not only got to see that just from the vantage point of being in the family, but some of my summer jobs when I was a teenager were going in there and actually helping them with technology and starting to help them digitize things like their customer lists and stuff like that. So I got to see company building from the inside. So that was pretty cool. David's fascination with tech deepened. As I got older, it was really the rise of Microsoft. And I I was really pretty enthralled with how Bill Gates had built that company and was kind of an avid reader of all things technology and the history of technology. Following his passion, David went to school for computer science at UC San Diego. Then he had a chance to land his dream internship at Microsoft. Within five minutes of the interview, Bill Gates recognized David's spectacular talent and they instantly became tech soulmates. Okay, I made up everything after I said David had a chance to land his dream internship at Microsoft. 
So I was going to do a summer internship. I guess it was after my, my junior year and I interviewed with Microsoft and, and IBM and I totally bombed the Microsoft interview, which is funny given my Bill Gates story, but because I had been doing like neural network development of this like multi-processor system to do hands-free radio for helicopter pilots in one of the branches of the, of the military. And so I like knew what I was doing and I got in this Microsoft interview and they gave me like this simple recursive thing to solve. And I just like totally blanked. And <laughs> so I, I got like a one page response from Microsoft. Thank you for your time. <laughs> But when one door closes, another door cracks open, this time because of a mutual love of cars. And with IBM, I actually hit it off with the guy because we ended up talking about cars and I like cars. And so I, I got an offer. So I took the job with IBM. It was, like I said, an internship to start with. And it was just supposed to be for the summer and really hit it off well with the team and what they were doing. I, it actually turned into a full year. And then even when I went back to school, I continued my my internship and all things happen for a reason. So I ended up meeting, you know, my wife and we ended up having a, a family here in North Carolina. So it's funny, the little tiny things that happen along the way that nudge you one way or the other. But that's how I ended up at IBM. For some people, landing a good job at a company like IBM could have been perceived as the final destination. For David, he saw it as a solid place to start out. I never expected to spend a lot of time at IBM. It was obviously a very large company and I, I had aspirations to be an entrepreneur. So I think for me, it was more just a stepping stone. It was a good job coming out of college just to get my footing. IBM was a great place for David to learn some business and personal lessons. IBM has been a phenomenal company over the years, but it's also struggled, I think, to maintain its relevance in certain areas. And in the early 90s, uh, in mid-90s when I joined, it was actually pretty formative because I saw a few things. This was a period of time where people were talking about breaking IBM up, and it was struggling. Lou Gerstner had just stepped into the role of CEO, and there's just a lot of questions about the future of IBM. And I saw husbands and wives who were working there, and sometimes they were getting laid off together, and they had put all their retirement savings in IBM stock, which wasn't doing well at the time. And so one of the formative things was you want to control your own destiny, right? It just reinforced entrepreneurship for me and the notion of controlling your destiny. And I also learned some things about how did I want to run a company? What were the principles that I thought worked in a large organization? And what were some of the things that, that I would do differently? And everybody has opinions about stuff, but there's nothing like going out and starting your own company to, to really put your, put your money where your mouth is. So David did just that. Moving forward in his career, he built and sold two companies. He was developing another company around the idea of micropayments when he ran into a troll. I had some investors lined up for it, but we found a patent troll that, that had some patents all the way back from the 900 number days, if you remember what, what those were, around carrier billing. And, and so I said to the investors, I don't want to raise your capital with this hanging over us. Although being thwarted by a patent troll seems super annoying, the experience for David ultimately brought him to a really interesting situation where he ended up meeting Scott Wingo, a co-founder of Channel Advisor. I ended up being an entrepreneur in residence with one of the potential investors, and that was a lot of fun. But that was just a place to hang out and help out while I figured out, hey, is there another company I want to start or what is it I'm going to do next? And so I had I happened to have coffee with Scott Wingo, and he's while you're trying to figure out what you're going to do next, why don't you come consult with us? We've got some stuff we could use some help on. And initially, it was like a two-month consulting assignment, literally a couple months in early 2006. And I think I was there two or three weeks, and Scott said, well, hey, why don't you join us full-time? And, you know, because we could use the help. And the company, I think at the time, was right around $10 million in revenue and growing like gangbusters and had a lot of companies at that stage that have hit at the right time, just like way more things that it needed to, to be done and people to, to do them. And I really like the team, Scott and some of the other folks and the customers in the e-commerce industry was really interesting back in 2006. And so I just fell into it. For David and Channel Advisor at that time, a lot was falling into place. Find out after the break how Channel Advisor was really positioned to take off alongside the growing e-commerce industry and how David and Scott became great teammates. When I need help, I want someone who understands where I am now and where I'm coming from, but with a broader perspective. The folks at Highland are like that. Highland is a true partner to more than half of Fortune 100 companies. 
a partner that understands your industry and offers expertly tailored solutions that evolve with you. With Highland, you gain a complete view of information across your organization, along with the agility to compete at the top of your game and deliver better customer experiences. Highland is your X factor for better performance. Go to highland.com forward slash insights to learn more. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D dot com slash insights. David and Scott Wingo, a co-founder of Channel Advisor, discovered in each other a well-balanced partnership. As things progressed, Scott and I are we're a really good duo because he's super visionary, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, he's around corners, and I'm more an operator type. The analogy I use is if he's Steve Jobs, I'm more the Tim Cook side of the spectrum. But it worked really well because, you know, we just had natural sort of complementary skills and it just became somebody he could trust to fix something or get something to, to a different stage. To understand how Channel Advisor was ideally situated to capitalize as the e-commerce industry developed, it requires delving into Scott and the company's history. This is before eBay was like the place where people could buy and sell products. And so back in the sort of early days, you had to go to a lot of different places. And Scott was a collector and still is a collector of like Star Wars memorabilia and other collectibles. And he would get frustrated because, you know, if you wanted to find something, he had to go to whatever, 10 or 15 or 20 different sites. And maybe you'd find something. Maybe it was just a very fragmented space. And so Auction Rover's purpose was to, now that I look back on it, essentially be like a Google for auction sites, right? Like, so a big overlay of a search engine on top of all these different sites. Eventually, Scott sold Auction Rover in 2000, but a year later was actually able to buy it back and at a discount. They decided to focus and double down on, on search. This thing that they had bought around auctions really wasn't core. And so Scott was able to buy it back at a pretty good discount. <laughs> it was good arbitrage on Scott's point. It seems that Scott had anticipated the potential in the e-commerce market all along. So that was actually the genesis. But it also made a lot of sense because Scott was still running the company as part of that acquisition. And it gradually morphed from a, a search engine into a set of tools to help sellers sell on eBay. If Scott were telling the story, he'd say, you know, we had this epiphany one day where we saw some companies like Sun Micro and I think Motorola actually using the platform to liquidate product, excess product. And so uh, that was actually the start. And it was this early epiphany. But the company's always been called Channel Advisor. It wasn't eBay Advisor or Auction Advisor. And so I think Scott, I mentioned earlier, he's, he's always been a visionary. And I think his view was, OK, number one, e-commerce is going to be big. Number two, there's going to be different ways to buy things. We'll call those channels, and eventually people are going to need help with that stuff. And that vision has been 100% consistent from day one to 20 years later. So I think that's pretty cool. So what exactly is Channel Advisor doing today, a little more than two decades after its founding? Our hypothesis is that our customers don't want to spend a lot of time stitching together systems that don't integrate, right? Because to really have a competitive advantage online, you need a high velocity, well-orchestrated, integrated set of processes. And our view is the more that we can pull those kind of key e-commerce elements, whether it's marketing, listing, selling, fulfilling, analyzing, and closing all that loop, if we can bring together a platform and a package that does that and does that globally, then our customers will really, really like having that on one platform. And it's been working really well for us. But it's also the case that that means there's always a risk of, am I an inch wide and a mile deep? Or do I go, am I a mile wide and an inch deep? And how do you kind of balance that? Finding that right middle ground is a problem organizations, small and large, young and old, face every business cycle. Channel Advisor finds a good equilibrium by focusing on being agile, including in how it budgets and measures decisions. Last year, in the middle of the year, the person who runs our services organization came to us with a proposal for a fairly significant incremental investment in our services organization and made the case for how it would pay off in terms of increased client retention, more expansion opportunities with clients. And it was a good proposal and it was chunked up into 
essentially pieces like here's what we need to put in here's what the payback period looks like and that gives us a really good yardstick to then say okay after the first six months after the first 12 months like what did we think was going to happen and what has happened and what have we learned from that and what adjustments do we need to make either up or, or down it's a process that makes a lot of sense if something isn't working mid-year or is working very well then it would be best for the investment to be adjusted right away not later but not every company provides that level of flexibility. It's always surprising to me how many companies do this fixed annual budgeting and then they make that the gospel. And, and of course, at some level, you are making some commitments, whether it's to your board or to your investors, but, but you have to be nimble in the tech industry, right? So we almost do a rolling budgeting process where every single quarter we're looking at, we've got a set of ideas from the last cycle, maybe we've got a couple new ideas, and then we, we basically look and say, okay, if we're tracking ahead of our plan and we have incremental opportunities to invest, like what are we going to do with the next best idea? And if we're not, like what are the things we can slow down or pause? So to me, it's like flying the plane, right? You just make adjustments based on changing weather patterns. But just like weather patterns aren't the only things pilots have to consider while in the air, financial agility isn't the only kind of agility that a company needs. A company also requires cultural and ethical agility and an ability to respond to employees' needs in real time. In this regard, Channel Advisor has calibrated its position concerning speaking out about equality. Channel Advisor, under David's leadership, has spoken out in favor of the Equality Act. Certainly, this is a clear choice, and other companies may not have taken the same approach. In early 2020, with George Floyd and, and some of the other things that were going on, it was clear that people were turning to business leaders to say something about some of the important issues of the day. And that includes our employees. Employees these days, I think, and I think this is a good thing, want to feel like they're working for a business that isn't just there to make money and there to serve shareholders. We Everybody knows that's a, those are important functions, but people also want to know that they're working for a purpose and for a greater good. We've always seen it as we get the best out of people when they can be who they are and they can feel like Channel Advisor is a welcoming, inviting environment. So we came into this period feeling like Channel Advisor has always been a, a pretty good model. For other companies, self-satisfaction about their perceived goodness could lead to stasis. But David and Channel Advisor were open to truly hearing their employees' experiences. We took the time to just have people talk and share their stories. And, and I have to tell you, I heard just some really profound stories, like courageous stories, amazing stories, where you just hear like what some people have to put up with on a day-to-day -day basis because of their race or their sexual identity or what have you. And... So I think what changed for us is this realization that while Channel Advisor may be a great place in those regards, there's still a lot of progress we need to make in, in other areas of society. The leadership at Channel Advisor reflected internally, and they decided to leverage that self-awareness within their organization to champion employees. And we owe it to our employees when it comes to things that affect them. OK, so we're not going to opine on every political issue, things that are just very tangential to our employees. But when it comes to things that do affect our employees, like the Equality Act, we're going to have a position on those things. And and I'm glad we have because I've heard more positive things from our employees who are basically just saying, I always loved working for Channel Advisor, but now it's a special place that means something. It's it's really kind of a visceral feeling that people have. And I'm, I'm glad we've done it. And I think it's important, right? Like we're helping in some small way, hopefully, to move the ball forward in a couple of key areas that affect our employees. This ability to respond quickly to its customers and employees has turned Channel Advisor into a dynamic, agile organization. Over time, these decisions compound, creating decision-making structures that become almost instinctual. I've been CEO now almost seven years, going back to 2015. And I've said this a couple of times that it wasn't until going through 2020 with COVID and the, the sort of social challenges and DE&I and all that kind of stuff. That was actually the, f the first time I really felt like I had come into my own, right? Because prior to that, it was a lot of building and operating and running the numbers. But that for me was a pivotal moment, especially we all remember the uncertainty of early COVID and lockdowns and like when I just ended up 
my strategy was just to be hyper communicative with our employees. So I don't know that it was necessarily driven by self-awareness or anything like that. I think it was just the moment. And it's one of those points in time where it wasn't, let's analyze the situation and based on data, here's what we're going to do. It was more like intuitively, if I were a new employee and we had just gone to work from home and I hadn't met hardly anybody in the company and maybe I am alone in an apartment and I'm scared or like, what would I want my CEO to do? And part of the answer was just communicate and just be super clear about how we're navigating and what we're doing. But how does a CEO or even an entire company develop better intuition? Maybe this is a contradiction, but I'm I'm a very data-driven sort of numbers guy, but I'm also very intuition-driven. And I think maybe, you know, so I turned 50 this year, right? So after you have a few decades under your belt, you start to see patterns emerge in the world <laughs> and you start to see things, the results of your decisions, even longer term results, and you start to become informed. And I don't want to use the word wise because I'm not... <laughs> Certainly my kids wouldn't necessarily say, yeah, dad's wise, but I think there's a certain point where you've experienced enough things that you have a pretty good bead on how things work and you develop, you know, Charlie Munger called them mental models or mental frameworks. David appears to see a connection between curiosity and discovering similarities or perhaps repeated patterns in different arenas that can help a person draw intuitive conclusions. I've always been very curious about lots of different things. Like my kids kind of roll their eyes, but if I had multiple lives, you know, I'd be a trauma surgeon in another life or I'd be an astronomer or what. Like I, I have a lot of different interests. And so what's cool about that though is there's a lot of overlap in different systems and different areas of interest. Like you wouldn't necessarily think it, but there's quite a lot that you can carry from one discipline into another. Intuition is important. If you overly rely on data, then you're either going to get paralyzed for lack of it, or you know, you're going to give yourself a false sense of precision, right? That somehow you're really going to know the outcome to three decimal points. So I think you got to be balanced in it. When you have data and when you have information, you should be driven by it. But when you don't, you got to make a call. And that's part of a CEO's job is just to make decisions in the absence of clear indications of which way to go. Leaders have to overcome fear to make decisions. At the end of the day, even a fear of failure can lead to an awareness that maybe there is no absolute failure at all, just different sections in a great book. I think I have sort of an irrational fear of failure. And I say irrational because like, I've never really experienced like big time failure and failure from a technology entrepreneur perspective is about the softest kind of failure you can have in the sense that if something doesn't work out, you know, I mean, unless you've really deceived people along the way, if, if you're just making an effort and something doesn't work out, the Silicon Valley is full of stories of comebacks and second chapters, third chapters. Ultimately, self-awareness allows David to understand his tendencies and calibrate his responses accordingly to make good decisions. But I'm also aware of it, right? So it makes me also, if I'm looking at an investment opportunity, whether it's an initiative we're looking at or an acquisition I know I'm wired to be more skeptical and more conservative. And because I know that, I can over-index a little bit on the other side of that and say, okay, well, what if I'm wrong? What if the thing that I think is likely, it actually ends up being unlikely? What's the outcome there? And, and so I actually use that as a tool to temper my own default behavior, if that makes sense. For David and Channel Advisor, Self-awareness develops into an intuition to make strong business and ethical decisions as different circumstances arise. They are not blind decisions, but instead are built on experiences, relevant data, and guts. I don't know about you, but when I have a decision to make, I look for information. I may look through emails, documents, photos, and files in multiple places. And if I'm lucky, I find what I'm looking for. So it's amazing to me that while I have trouble finding a single file, some organizations' success hinges on making sure that the right people can get all the right information they need when and where they need it. Like hospitals, insurers, banks, and all sorts of businesses. I don't know how they do it, but our friends at Highland do. Highland empowers more than half of 2020 Fortune 100 companies with tools that help make sure the right information gets to the right folks easily and automatically and makes business processes smarter and more efficient. Highland is your X factor for better performance. 
Go to highland.com forward slash insights to learn more. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D dot com slash insights. You've been listening to Business X Factors, created by our team here at mission.org and brought to you by Highland. Are you enjoying this show? If so, I'd be so grateful if you reviewed and rated us on Apple or Spotify, as this helps ensure that more listeners like you find the show and lets me know how I'm doing. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to dive even deeper into the topics discussed, be sure to check out the resources section of our show notes, where we've included helpful links, articles, and books, including any stat or story referenced in this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, and I'll catch you next time on Business X Factors. Business X Factors.